Welcome to Security Now, your source for cybersecurity news and interviews with your hosts, Ken Hess and Preston Smith. Hello, everyone. I'm Ken Hess, and this is a very special edition of the Security Now show. We're on video, as you can see, and my guest today is Ken Dwight, a.k.a. the Virus Doctor, and we're going to be speaking about ransomware. And we've talked about ransomware several times on the podcast show, but now we're going to talk about it in real time on video. And uh, Ken is a, an expert on ransomware and viruses of all kinds, I'm pretty sure. So uh, we're going to get right to it. Welcome to the show, Ken. Oh, thank you, Ken. Uh, Good to be the here. The two Kennys, we, yeah. should, we should start a show. I, I can remember your name. <laughs> that's right. At my age, that's saying something. <laughs> <laughs> no. So um, tell us about yourself. Well, uh, I'm one of those people that's been in the industry forever, starting in 1966. Uh, computers didn't look like this back then. Right. But uh, I've been in the PC into things since 82 and developed a specialty in viruses back in 2002. And that's when I took on the name of the virus doctor, got it trademarked and published a book under that name. Wow. So that's been my specialty. I still do a lot of other computer related stuff too, but uh, uh, there's enough with, with viruses and ransomware to keep me pretty busy. Right, um, yes, there are plenty of uh, malware issues to keep us all busy. So in, you said 1982 you got into the PC uh, end of viruses. You know, I remember uh, at that time, maybe a little later, uh, we called them flu shots, remember? Because it was viruses and they said yeah. flu shots. Were you involved at all in ever uh, creating some of those flu shots or anti-malware programs? No, I never did. And I'm a, a programmer from way back, but I've never actually written any antivirus code. It's been more working with, with vendors that uh, know it. And, and I've come up with, I've, I've written specs for some programs that have in turn gotten written and are part of, of what I tell people about. But... Uh, Never actually written any, any virus code. Oh, wow. So uh, you've done a couple of talks here at Spice World 2017. Uh, could you tell us uh, about those? Sure. Those talks were, the, the title is Strike Back Against Encrypting Ransomware. And the whole essence of what I was talking about is the fact that once you get hit by encrypting ransomware, then you need to know how to deal with it. And there are a lot of, of presentations out there and free webinars and then white papers and everything on preventing it. And mostly by vendors, if, if you use our product, you don't have to worry about it type stuff, which we all know is not the case. Yeah. But at any rate, uh, my presentation took the position, okay, you've been encrypted, now what? And so uh, it's dealing more with the, the remediation, knowing what your choices are, and uh, uh, making some informed decisions as to what direction you go with it. Right. So what, what's your one suggestion, I mean, besides don't panic, uh, what's your one suggestion if you have one for people who have been hit by encrypting ransomware? The most important thing is to know what family and strain of ransomware it is because that determines what your outcome is. There are so many, there, there are literally thousands of different variants out there uh, made up of hundreds of families, and then each one of those families may have anywhere from one or two to hundreds of variations on it. Wow. And the point is, depending on which one you've been hit by, you may or may not be able to get your data back without paying for it, or at all, uh, or you may just have to give up. Oh, gosh. Uh, but the starting point is to know what you're dealing with. Right. Unfortunately, most techies, the, the automatic reaction when they've got a malware issue is to go get rid of it. Right. And if you do that, if you do what you're normally inclined to do as a geek, uh, you're going to shoot yourself in the foot because that process will keep you from being able to find out what strain it is and what your options are. Well, you know, once you find out what strain, uh, is there a way to, to clean the ransomware or to get rid of it without paying the ransom in Bitcoin? There may be. Uh, I've had a couple of cases of that where I have been able to recover the, the data files without paying the ransom. Uh, statistically, it's not very likely. Most of the ransomware today does follow best practices in terms of how they did the encryption. And as you know, encryption is a powerful thing. When it's done right, it really is pretty much uncrackable. Right. Now, on the other hand, all of the antivirus, anti-malware companies are continuously researching every new strain as it comes out, looking for flaws in how the decryption was done and a way to come up with a, a way of getting the data back for free. And there are hundreds of free decryptors out there, which sounds like a good thing, and it is, but it's just a, a small part because there are, again, thousands of different ran uh, ransomware samples. And unfortunately, once a free decryptor is developed, 
it's not just the, the good guys that see it. The bad guys see it too. They say, oh, here's how they figured out how to do the free decryptor, and so they, they patch that hole. Oh, wow. So even though there are hundreds of free decryptors out there, they have a very short shelf life. And so I don't have an exact number, but my guess is there may be about five that, that are still useful today. Oh, wow, I didn't know yeah. that. So that's why it's so important to know not only what family of ransomware you're dealing with, but what generation, what strain, uh, because there may or may not be a free decryptor. Well, what happens now? We know in, in companies they sometimes have backups, or you know we hope they have backups. Uh, but you know what happens when someone at home gets encrypted? I mean, you know, you have this person who's not really a, a super computer person, and they get this message on their screen that they've been encrypted, and they have to buy so much Bitcoin to uh, to get the code. I mean, what do they do? They don't know what to do when they see this. They really don't, and kind of the good news is that in most cases, if they do get the Bitcoin and pay the ransom, they will get their data back. Uh, now, having said that, none of us want to support these criminal enterprises. That, that right. They are criminals, yes. and so you can't trust them. There's no money back guarantee, right. and, and the whole idea of, yeah. of Bitcoin is that it's untraceable, non-refundable, and, and so you're taking your chances, but statistically, most of the serious ransomware creators have made the business decision that it's in their best interest to give you the decryption key if you pay up. Because if, if the word gets around that, yeah, this will get your data back, that's a whole lot better for them than if the word gets around that, no, don't even pay the ransom, you're not right. going to get your data back. Right. Now, that's not to say that there's 100% uh, that if you pay the ransom, you're going to get your data back. But statistically, the numbers I hear are anywhere from about 75 to 90% of the people that have paid have gotten their data back. Right. So uh, should a person pay the ransom? There's no one right answer to that. Uh, the, the moral answer is no. Right. Uh, the, the, the what's best for society answer is no. Uh, as a practical matter, sometimes it's a, a pure business dollars and cents decision. And unfortunately, one of the things that's happened in the, in the last year or so especially is the bad guys have gotten much more sophisticated in terms of figuring out who they've encrypted and how much they're likely to be able or willing to pay for, for uh, the decryption key. In the early days, it was a flat $100 or $300 or a Bitcoin or right. a tenth of a Bitcoin or whatever. But now, more and more of them are saying, oh, this is a hospital. They'll pay big bucks. And, and, and that wow. really was started by one hospital in L.A. that paid $20,000. And then so uh, the latest I've heard is at least half of the hospitals have been hit by encrypting ransomware because it's such a, a sweet target. Right. There are literally lives at stake. Yeah. And uh, uh, with, if, you're, if they realize that they've been encrypted a Fortune 500 company, they know they've got a lot of money. And sure. so they could potentially pay. Now, hopefully they've got good backups in place and an IT department that's taking good care of them, but that's not a given. Right. So what happens with the uh, encrypted data? I mean, it's uh, people's pictures and documents and so on. Are they just, uh, I mean, can you remove them and replace them with backed up files? Yes. If you have good backups and if the backups haven't been encrypted, uh, then that, that's the, the right solution. Uh, the catch is a lot of the... Well, as you know, everybody doesn't do backups. Uh, the people that think they're doing backups, sometimes it's on a set and forget type of schedule. They just assume that every night it's happening, right. and in fact it hadn't been happening for months for whatever reason. Uh, but the other part of that is depending on what backup method they're using, the backups may be encrypted too. Pretty much any encrypting ransomware will not only encrypt the, the local hard drive, but any other drive it has access to an external hard drive that's being used for backups, a network share, a thumb drive, anything it has access to will get encrypted as well. Network shares? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yikes, that's bad for people who are networked, uh, which most everyone is. Even even in homes today, people are networked. Yeah. Wow, and That's I didn't the other that. thing that's a complicating issue is the fact that the encrypted files may actually be on a machine that's not infected. And so just because the files that are encrypted are on a machine, that doesn't mean that that machine, especially if it's a server. Most servers are not getting infected by the, the, the malware itself. They happen to be hosting the files that have gotten encrypted. But you can run scans all day on a, on a server and not see any infection. Right. Now, when a, a computer gets infected and it encrypts files, let's say, on a file server, and then you uh, restore good files that aren't encrypted, 
does the ransomware stay on the infected machine, or, or can it, and can it re-encrypt? Absolutely. That, that's one of the reasons it's so important to know what you're dealing with, and because in some cases, once the encryption is done, the ransomware, the, the, the infection itself is no longer active. So there again, if you do a scan, you won't find anything malicious running. On the other hand, there are some that keep running continuously, so that if you do restore from backups, it'll encrypt them as well. If you create a new file, it'll get encrypted. And so before you even do any restore, you need to make sure that there's not an active infection running. So how do you find out what strain and, and what uh, subversion of these ransomware attacks, how do you find out what you have? In general terms, th there are quite a few clues that you can use. The ransom note will sometimes identify, now you can't take that at face value, because there's a lot of surprise, surprise pirating of ransom notes. <laughs> <laughs> Rather than, than develop a ransom note from scratch, they'll just copy somebody else's, and, and so That's it fine. may or may not be accurate. Uh, but depending on the content and some of the things that are, that are in the ransom note and the format of it, that could be a clue. The, uh, uh, the file name. Typically, with most ransomware, once it's been encrypted, it will also append a new extension to the file. So it may be document.docx.petcha or whatever. And, and so that extension is a clue, a pretty good clue as far as which family of ransomware you're dealing with. Uh, ultimately, the only way you know for sure is to look inside the, the actual uh, document or file and see what kind of changes have been made. And that's something that, that the average user and even the average tech doesn't typically have access to. But the antivirus, anti-malware vendors do. And there are a couple of sites that actually will help with the identification. Uh, there's, there's one called uh, no more ransom that uh, will let you upload a ransom note and a couple of sample files, inf encrypted files, and they'll pretty much do that an analysis for you. There's no more ransom. There's another site called ID Ransomware that the URL is about like that, so I won't, hmm. won't try to, to spit it out. I couldn't, but uh, anyway, uh, same idea. You upload a ransom note and an encrypted file, and it'll come back and tell you this is a such and such family and probably a such and such variation. <laughs> And they'll also tell you uh, either uh, there's a free decryptor available, click here to get to it, or it'll say, uh, based on, on what we're hearing from people that have had this one, if you pay the ransom, you'll probably get a decryption key that works. Or it may say, this one is not decryptable, even if you pay the ransom. Oh, wow. So is there a particular country that these are coming from, or is it kind of all over the place. Uh, they're, they're mostly from the usual suspect. Uh, <laughs> Russia, China. Uh, yeah, yeah, and, and, and mostly the uh, former Soviet republics. Uh, Russia, Ukraine, uh, uh, the, the usual. Right, the usual suspects. Uh, and the last number I heard was something over 90% are from, from that block. Interesting. China is a player, but not so much in the ransomware area. Um, Interesting. I would, have, I would have thought that they were more into it. Sorry, my Chinese friends. But, uh, yeah, Russian, uh, that, that makes sense. And, of course, there's a lot of technical expertise in Russia. Sure. They're very educated people, and uh, uh, they know about malware. Have you ever been hit by ransomware yourself? I have not personally. Uh, I have quite a few clients that have and quite a few people that weren't clients that called me after the fact. I'll bet, yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and I've been successful in actually recovering some, some data for free. Oh, good. Uh, in fact, the, the first one I did was probably a year ago, and... I forget the exact numbers, but it's, it was uh, a file server situation. There were, I think, 38,000 and some files that had been encrypted. There was a free decryptor available. I got it, and, and it decrypted, uh, I think it was like 99.26% 90, of them. Oh, very and good. so the client was very happy. I'll bet. Now, my fee was more than the ransom would have been, well, but at least they were supporting a legitimate business and sure. not a criminal enterprise. Right. Uh, so how, what's the... the the way that most ransomware is delivered? Is it email or is it something else? There again, it's kind of all the usual suspects. Every method that's ever been used for any form of, of malware is being used for ransomware. Uh, certainly emails, attachments, uh, infected links. But ransomware has really put a lot more focus, especially lately, on uh, infecting websites and even more than that, malvertising. Uh, malvertising meaning that, that a website, a legitimate website, uh, has advertisements on it. Now those advertisements are not hard coded into the website. What's right. hard coded is a box that says insert ad here. Right. Now they in turn use ad servers to look on that machine and see what kind of searches they've been doing, what's in their cookies, what they might be interested in. 
and then plug in an appropriate ad for that individual. So what the bad guys have been doing is creating infected ads and manipulating the search engine optimization to get them to the top of the list, get them into that box. And so as soon as that page is rendered, the machine's infected without the user having to do anything stupid. That's, that's really bad news. Yeah, and, and it's, that's also become the most prevalent method of infection these days. Wow. So uh, what can we do to prevent ransomware? I mean, with things like that. Well, there, there's a, a whole litany of things, and like anything else related to, to malware in general, there's no 100% solution. It requires a layered defense, uh, everything from uh, Internet security suites, antivirus programs and all that, uh, down to user training. Uh, because a high percentage are still the result of a user clicking on something they shouldn't. Uh, opening an attachment or clicking on a link or doing something that if they had better awareness of what the, the risks were and how to recognize them, that could be prevented. Now that, that's still the, the weakest link in the chain. Right. Uh, there are technological solutions for most of the other stuff, especially with a good internet security suite that includes a firewall, that includes a malicious website blocking and URL filtering and, and things like that. Uh, in my presentation that I've given here at Spice World, I actually go through about 20 different pieces of that, that puzzle that, that need to be in place for maximum protection. Well, those, those are kind of the highlights. So how does someone get in contact with you if they... Uh become infected with ransomware? Uh, easiest way is my website, thevirusdoc.com, okay. and uh, uh, I respond to those requests pretty quickly. Very good. And you're local to Austin? No, I'm in Houston. In Houston, okay. So, close. And, and so do you cover a region or all of Texas? Actually, or? most of what I do is teaching other techies how to do what I do, okay. and I do that in person and online. And so I have graduates now in, I think it's up to 42 states and seven countries. Oh. And uh, okay. so there I'm mainly dealing with people that are doing support for other people, either managed service providers, computer stores, break fix shops, or whatever. And so they in turn touch a lot of people. And, and if there's something, most of, of the, the techniques and tools that I teach and use uh, can clean a machine remotely. But if it requires something on site, if it's not bootable, a blue screen or something like that, then I have enough graduates around the country and around the world I can generally refer them to somebody. Oh, very good. Okay, well, thank you for coming on the Security Now show today, and thank you for watching. I'm Ken Hess, and I've been speaking with Ken Dwight, a.k.a. The Virus Doctor. Be sure to go to thevirusdoc.com, and he will be sure to help you out. Thank you, and I'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you for watching Security Now with Ken Hess and Preston Smith. We'll see you next time. And remember to stay secure.